All right, guys, welcome to another Leah member hangout, chit chat, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm joined here by Victor. Before I intro him, there's a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we actually just put together a pretty cool webinar that you guys can get access to for free for a limited time. Landinvestor.co slash first deal. It's 90 days to your first deal. So if I was brand new, this is exactly what I would want to go and do in my next 90 days. You'll get my first contract. More than likely, that deal is not going to sell within that same 90 day window. But go get a contract. It's happened. The crazier things have happened. For example, we took two brand new land investors and we started them with $10,000. And in 90 days, we turned that into $240,000 of gross pipeline profit. So crazier things have happened. In fact, we documented that whole thing in our 90 days zero to hero program, um, which we are publicly releasing again here in the next couple of months or next couple of weeks, really. Um, but this is a great place to start. Definitely recommend. Go check that out. Uh, same thing. We released a free Chrome extension, landinsight.co slash Chrome. Uh, it's a really cool way just to kind of run price breaker comps. It works on every platform. So land.com, Redfin, Zillow, you can go and quickly see, oh, it's 9,000 an acre, for example. And when you pop up to any of those websites, it auto selects your filter. So if I go to Redfin, it's selected on land. It can be selected on sold or, or actively listed. One of the things that really adds up for you and your team is if you go to Redfin, for example, and it always auto selects all of the different real estate filters and it always is on active. So I'm like, go to sold 12 month, click land. It's small, but that compounds like a minute per search and it really does add up and it gets kind of annoying. So anyways, all right, let's get into it. Without further ado, Victor, what's up, man? Who are you? Where are you calling in from? Give the folks some context. Yep. Uh, and first, I want to thank you for uh, having me on. Uh, it's been super helpful, like just learning from all the other Leah members and everyone you've interviewed in the past. But uh, touching on myself, uh, my name is Victor Pasmino. Uh, I'm here in the Chicagoland area, born and raised. Um, getting started into like my Leah journey, uh, how I kind of got into it was through you. Uh, we a uh, little backstory is, you know, we've worked together in the past. Uh, and that was during the time that I moved to San Diego. Uh, I was down there for like a year, just trying to get my my first big break in the digital marketing space. So uh, that's where, you know, we kind of worked together. You were on the sales side. I was doing the digital marketing and then we would kind of chit chat in between, you know, because there is, uh, you know, some synchronicity, just kind of like balancing the two in a business in general. So uh, with that, I started there in digital marketing and I just kind of like had my head down and just focused on that for like, you know, those years leading into it, like the last four or five plus years. Uh, and then from that, I kind of like stumbled upon your content as I was like, you know, just getting in the more in depth with like my stuff and my business. And it started taking off. Like I started uh, with my digital marketing. I started getting like more clients, referrals, word of mouth, uh, things of the nature. And I kind of like uh, tiptoed my way into the land uh, just through your content. So um, I was like, oh, okay. I started seeing your posts and I was like, man, that's super interesting. Um, but I, I still never like dove into it. You know, I kind of saw like the content and I was like, you know what? I need to focus on like this one thing. Um, but really stood out to me still were like the margins that you were speaking versus like what I was doing in the digital marketing space. So I was still going about my business, working through, uh, working with agencies and then managing my old cl clients. And that's kind of been the back and forth, uh, that I've been going through, um, even till now. So uh, fast forward to today, uh, I am full time uh, with my digital marketing business. So I do have uh, about seven clients now. So I'm running that full time and then doing land as like a part time. But leading into it, uh, I probably have been diving into the land stuff for like the last year. I think that's how long it's been uh, since I've been in the Leo course. So it's been a little bit of a struggle because I was in and out of like W2s and then balancing my clients and then fitting land in between. So I've been in and out of like two, three jobs, I guess, if you really yeah. think about it, you know, so like my time has been like, so uh, finite, like it and, and managing my time has been a little bit of a struggle, just trying to work things in between. And then also with like, you know, the the Leah and the land insights updates, like uh, getting more involved with that. But long story short is uh, right now, currently I'm full time doing digital marketing and then I'm doing, uh, you know, land on the side. Uh, but I do have one deal that I, I've done already, and that was brewing since like November. November, I mailed a batch of about 7,000, uh, or no, excuse me, uh, it was about 45,000. Um, I ended up locking up that deal end of December, ended up going live in January, and now we're about to cash out this month. So um, nice. from the time of listed, it, was, it listed about the end of January, and now it's... Um, 
it's about to sell this month or i would say within the next week week and a half uh we're just wrapping up like the perk test and that was a buy for 40 sell for uh 95. so i actually listed that on my youtube channel that that call of me just uh, working on the negotiation process with that seller so if you guys want to check it out i don't know if you, you linked it already uh sumner but um super interesting experience going through the process and now that i have it kind of dialed in it's just working through it and getting more volume uh with my mailers uh you know on that so yeah, yeah that's just the rundown of what's been going on Ooh. you know few months yeah a lot, a lot to unpack there um yeah. I, don't, I don't have the link on this little banner but i'll make sure i put it in the description for everyone and probably the easiest thing too just search victor past me and i'm sure that it'll come up right yeah, if you search Victor Pasmino land, it, it should come up now. It'll I believe now that, that video's actually been getting some traction now. So um, yeah, it popped yeah. off. We should, we should, I don't know what it was at before, but I saw a ton of people watched it. And that's one thing that I mm -hmm. wanted to speak to you before we get into the nitty gritty is like, man, what a what a what an opportunity to be able to document your journey. You know, one of my few regrets is not documenting my origin story. I think I had a pretty interesting origin story even way before when you and I worked together. And what's funny is I've had these little spits and bursts in my life, starting from the age of 12 of making YouTube videos. You can go back and look at Green Hour 45. That was my first YouTube channel. I and mean, I've been making videos for a long, long, long time, but I never stuck with it. I would go for like two years at a time, stop. It's the same thing. I did that in my, my uh, teenage years, early 20s. And I really wish I just stuck with it. So my advice to you is stick with it. <laughs> just keep documenting. And ultimately, I think it like what I've learned on YouTube We'll probably hit 10,000 subscribers in the next, know, maybe this month, maybe, maybe next month. And to get there, holy crap, has it taken a lot of videos. But then it does start to pick up steam and it starts to kind of build momentum of its own. But to get that escape velocity is just unbelievable how much how much work it takes. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's effort that's worth doing. And ultimately, I think for folks on the sidelines, there's nothing more inspiring than seeing someone's hero journey and seeing them go from zero to hero. It's pretty dope and have that all documented. Really cool. You look at a, a guy like Eamon Godsey, I think that's one of the reasons people like he's so revered is because he's documented his origin story. The other things I think a lot of people, well, actually, I'll, I'm going to ask you, and I got so much to unpack you, but I'm going to ask you, why haven't you released another video? Not to put you on the spot. Why haven't you released another video? I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Yeah. So I had this whole like strategy plan and I still have everything already laid out, like everything from the script, the thumbnails, everything. Uh, it's just the editing. So that I'll probably definitely, um, offload that to someone on Fiverr, which that's what I did initially with the first video. And uh, that's a whole nother thing is trying to understand how to go about the content game, but also just, just get it out. Right. Like that's, yeah. that was my whole point of like getting that first one out. Um, but with that, in the mix of that, um, a little bit of life stuff and then my marketing biz like started like taking off a little more. So like I've had to onboard new clients, offboard some, and then with that, it's just, there's a lot that goes into digital marketing for those of you that aren't aware of like running Facebook ads or Google. Um, it, it's just the, you know, working through the, the iteration process, the build process, especially with a new client, the, there's a lot of time that is involved with not only one scheduling meetings to get the, an understanding of like the business, but then you also have like the build phase. And then if it's like Facebook, it involves a little more uh, creativity and like research development to actually get the content up and like compile it. And then I'm editing them myself just because like I'm so, I'm trying to stay as lean as possible. But even that, that can chew up, you know, anywhere from like four to maybe eight hours. And like, you know, the first two or three is doing research and the rest is like actually editing the content and making those batches. So for me, that's where a lot of my time has been is just really, you know, focusing on like my clientele, making sure uh, I'm delivering as best as possible a service. Um, and then that leads to like retention. And that's why like some of the clients that I've had, they've been around for about four or five years, you know? So like, that's been like the base of like my business right now. And what's been keeping me afloat and keeping the lights on, honestly, is, you know, my marketing biz. So it's been like stair-stepping my way into that, but then you have like land, right? So it's like focus on clients, getting a land mailer out and then content. That's kind of like the line. So I've been just kind of like back and forth trying to balance that and make sure that I get all those things in play before I, you know, go out and transition to the content. Cause, um, for me, like my mindset is just getting the ball rolling, right? Like making sure my clients are happy, making sure the marketing's going and then focus on the content. So for me, it's been a back and forth, really trying to balance that. And, you know, my goals with like digital marketing is to focus on, you know, just a few main clients that I really want to just put all my time and attention because I don't, I don't have that much time. So I would rather work with, you know, 
a, a set amount of clients that, you know, will not only keep the lights on, but I can actually deliver because there's a law of diminishing returns once I bring on too many clients too, right? Then mm -hmm. my capacity is that much more cut down. And then that takes away from land, you know, then it seeps into like, you know, my my life and it's like i try to like balance it but there's times where you're, hey you just got to go through the grinder and this is the season that i'm in so adopting that mindset and just knowing like hey this is where i'm at and this is what what needs to get done um is will help you know i i would say is helping me at least in the now is just like adding more time even working like weekends right it's like us as entrepreneurs we we really don't unplug there's no clock in clock out so for me i'm always on but it's also like just finding time and really that that compounds over time, you know, adding in, you know, that those that extra hour or two, you know, here and there definitely goes a long way. So for me, like working on weekends is essential because it helps me get ahead for the next week and then I can actually get a mailer out. Like, for instance, for me right now, I kind of caught up to speed with all of, of my client stuff and some of them went on vacation. Um it's been able to open up the my schedule now to like focus on land. So now I barely got back into like getting the hang of like, you know, the recent um, land insights uh, updates. So then that way I can, you know, go ahead and find markets, scrub them and then get my next next batch of, of mailers out. But we can touch on that when we get on the, uh, that topic. But there's a lot yeah. I want to unpack on that, it, yeah. which is yeah, 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 yeah. immensely in this stage that I'm in right now. Like it is definitely uh opened up more bandwidth for me to do a lot of other stuff and just get in and out of, you know, the market research part. But yeah. Yeah. And for you guys that don't know what Victor's talking about, it's land insights, which is a tool that we built. And I've always said there's three ways to create leverage in a land business or three ways to kind of grow a land business that hopefully doesn't require all of your energy, and all your effort. We think about eliminating. So inside of Leah, we eliminate a lot of the fluff that's irrelevant. Like the way Victor's able to do a deal, it's got 45K of spread. is just by kind of honing in on, on certain markets, certain price points. It's just a certain strategy opposed to trying to do every kind of land deal out there. There's a lot of different land businesses you could run. Inside of Leah, we just kind of focus on this little mid-market sliver. The next is delegation, so building a team. And the third is automation, which there's never been a way to automate any part of the land business until Land Insights. That pretty much automates a lot of like just the, the marketing piece of this business. We save about eight hours per week per user or market selections, about 8.7 hours. Brings their time down from 10 hours of market selection a week to about two hours of market selection a week. And if you're scrubbing your data, you're talking about saving dozens, and some, in some cases, even hundreds of hours. We, we have people that are, that are pushing 50,000 records a month through the platform individually. Bro, to, I mean, that's probably 200 plus hours of someone's time if you were to hire a VA to do it. So it's a pretty big difference. We just opened up 50 new spots already, like, I don't know, five or six of them have been taken. We just released some, I think last Thursday or Wednesday, landinsights.co slash apply if you guys want to schedule a demo call. Bunch of things I want to unpack here. Hopefully this is interesting for people, but Victor, my biggest recommendation, everything you just told me, document that. That's a video. Don't think about scripting. Don't think about content ideas. Don't think about editing. Just super raw. Pick up the phone and document the, the struggles, the woes. The fact that you're even struggling trying to prioritize what's what and, and, and even making content to struggle and you, and you document. And I think that like the quantity starts to inform the quality. So like my videos out of the gate were shite and they're still not that, they're still like not that polished or amazing. And I know they'll get better over time, but I'm just like quantity, quantity, quantity. And I know the quality will catch up. Uh, I also think that there's a trend on YouTube of getting away from the hyper polished Mr. B style videos. People want a little more authenticity. And I think what you're going through right now, you don't even need a script. That's the video itself. And I would just commit to once a week, no matter what's going on, I'm just documenting, hey, I'm fucking struggling today because I got this client thing going on and I'm trying to get a mail around, da, 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 da. I think people are going to resonate with that. Hey, you might say, well, Sumner, what's the point of even doing all this? I mean, ultimately, media is a form of leverage as well. I don't know how that's going to impact you, but I know it will impact you. Whether there's people wanting to partner on deals or your, yeah, I mean, I think uh, without a doubt, your media company growing, like that seems obvious, or even increasing retention for your clients because your clients can see behind the scenes how hard you're working and then build a connection with you. You know, So there's all these ancillary benefits. What I wanted to say, though, the working on the weekend thing is such a sleeper. Like People don't understand the difference that working four hours every weekend does. Let's say you work four hours every weekend. That's an extra 208 hours of working time a year, 52 weeks, right? That's like, I mean, a, a work month is 160 hours or 40 hours a week. So you just bought back more than a month of working time by four hours spread out between Saturday and Sunday. That ain't that hard. And I actually find the weekends to be my most productive time. It's like no one's slacking me or texting me or anything like that. Well, the thing that I forgot to mention, and we'll get into the actual specifics of your land business and all that stuff. And guys, go and go and watch Victor's video, comment, get him to post more videos. You know, I think sometimes you just seeing a little bit of positive feedback helps motivate us.
the trouble with on YouTube, you don't see positive feedback for a long time. So hopefully we can artificially engineer it. Uh, I was getting like 30 views a video for you know for a very, very long time. And we still don't even get that many views, but it's just chipping away. So Victor and I worked together at the same company. It's like the only real job I had ever had. Maybe same for you too, Victor. Was that your first like real job? Uh, no, I've been in and out. So I, before that, I was actually uh, a programmer. So I worked in the software space. Oh. And that's when I had this epiphany of like getting into entrepreneurship. But I saw digital marketing as like a segue into that, you know, because it's like, oh, there's a career out of this. Uh, I dabbled with Amazon FBA. And that's kind of how I got yeah. my start with PPC. So okay, yeah. cool. I did the Amazon FBA thing too. But we were working together this company. Uh, There's a few people there that were scheming, trying to figure out business ideas and whatnot. And I remember when I introduced the land business, just started talking about it a little bit more. Pretty much everyone was like, "That was the stupidest thing ever." I think you were one of the few believers that I had some curiosity around it, which is very interesting. But fast forward till now. I think three people from that company have actually joined Leah or started the land or whatever. So it's kind of interesting to see it come full circle. But I think you're the only one that's actually stuck with it, right? Which that's 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 an accolade. The problem is people see the margins of this business and they get all excited. You can make 45K on a deal, but they forget like this isn't just going and flipping shit at the garage sale. Ultimately, it is a real business. So talk about that. Like what's been your experience first year into land? Did it line up with expectations harder, or easier? What, 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 what have you learned that year? Yeah, so I would say, you know, for anyone that's new, you, you would have to go through that process. And I, I've went through that process with digital marketing. So I've kind of already uh, like been primed for setting my own expectations, getting into the land biz, uh, not only yeah. like getting my own freelance digital marketing business up and running. Uh, I went through my fair share of struggles of understanding what it's like. And I see some similarities with like going after smaller ticket, uh, you know, smaller clients versus mid to large size clients. And there's so many similarities with that leading into land. You know, I see so like everything from like setting up the ops, going about sales, marketing. So a lot of these skills uh, that I've learned with digital marketing, I've been able to transfer that into my land biz. And I feel like that's something that definitely helped with my success and helped me stay in it uh, where I'm still in it now. Like just following through is that experience of knowing what it's like to eat shit, to be honest, um, trying to grind and like close clients, you know, having marketing campaigns that flop, you know, time and time again, which there's, you know, been so many times where I'll, I'll whip up a campaign and it flops. But um, yeah, it's just one of those things that like I've already learned that and transitioned the, those skills and experiences into the land and it's helped me stick with it. Yeah, like I've only launched one mailer and I've been in it a year, but that, the, you know, I'm still all in with land, you know, and it's just having that mindset of like getting back in, getting back in and wherever I can squeeze in time, I will to like advance myself in the land biz, whether that's, you know, consuming a little bit of content. I try not to dive too much into it because I know at the end of the day I have to get mail out. So same goes for like my marketing business. Like I can only focus so much on growth on that part where I kind of put that on a pause and referrals have been keeping me afloat. You know, I'm, I'm very grateful for, you know, all the opportunities that have came and everyone that I've worked with uh, and that I'm currently working with. But um, going back to land, like I said, that's that's been my focus. Rather than putting that growth into my biz, I'm just like mainly focusing on retention with my current clients and putting the growth mindset and all the efforts into to land. Um, to advance yeah. that. So um, yeah, that's kind of how it's been. And that's kind of why uh, I've been able to stick with land is because I've kind of had that experience. I think you, like you touched on, like from uh, some of the people that we, we've worked with, I don't think they've been through the ringer of going through their entrepreneurial journeys, kind of like yourself, you've dabbled with YouTube, you've done like, uh, I believe like fitness coaching, right? At one point, um, you, you've done a lot of different business opportunities and you know what it takes uh, to get one off the ground, but also like, you know, what makes it successful or not. So at the end of the day, it, it stems from like your mindset, but um, it's definitely uh, a huge help if you've been through that before and you've had some type of business experience, but if not, it's definitely one that you will learn. And I would say like with land, the cool thing is like, you can screw up and still make like 20 K profit, which is crazy. Yeah. Like, like what business can you do that with? Like for me, like I can screw up and stumble on like $300 an hour, uh, $300 an hour, 300, uh, 300 to like 1500 um 
you know, dollars a month for a client, but with land, yeah. you can just screw up and make 20 K, which is insane. Like, <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever seen that or nor experienced it myself. So once I got that first deal, I was hooked. I was like, I just have to stick with it and just continue to uh, dig and, and move the needle forward. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Dude, there's a, yeah, there's a real, um, there's an art to doing hard things. And I find it doesn't even just relate to, to folks that have done other businesses. I mean, just doing hard things, whether it's running marathons or fucking hiking Everest or whatever. Just, I, I find that folks that have challenged themselves before come into land and their expectations are, are grounded in reality. And the expectation is literally everything in life worth doing is going to be challenging, especially in business. There's no, there's no business model exists that's easy. And in fact, I always think it's like the dude starting a landscaping business is working probably just as hard as I am starting X, Y, and Z business. But ultimately, the, the difference of where we end up is not hard work. It's it's the vehicle that we're in. And so Lane is one of the best vehicles out there. But I think folks just haven't gone through enough hard things or built enough businesses. So they come in and they, they think it's some they think it's like, I don't know, like treasure hunting. Like somehow like they just there's just deals out there floating and you just pick one off the shelf and make a ton of money. It's like, oh, this is a business and it's hard. But all things being relative, it's a really great business model. There's a real margin of safety that you just don't find in other businesses. And you can screw up royally and still have um you know great outcomes and that's why I, I think one thing that you bring up too that's really smart and this is exactly what i did is like don't go quit your day job or don't go quit your income producing thing right off the rip and think that land is somehow going to fill the void of paying for all your lifestyle and grow even if you're so fortunate as to to make a couple hundred grand your first year which isn't uncommon well that money's not really years ultimately that's the business's money that's going to go back to reinvesting to grow the thing because more than likely you're going to want to grow the thing that's just that's just the itch that we all have and so even if you print 400K your first year, it's like, dude, you might live off 75 grand if you're smart and then parlay the rest of it back into the business. So I think the smartest thing that you can do is like, do not deprive the business of oxygen, which is cash flow for the first two years, ideally. That is brilliant. So if you've got a side hustle or a business or another job, like keep it. And it's a hard ball to juggle, but guys like Victor and myself and plenty of others have done it. Uh, and when it's time to go all in, you'll know. I think usually having a really fat nest egg in your bank account to where you're like, dude, this thing could not work for a year or two and I'm good, you're in a great spot. And one of the things that people don't realize too is like, you might make 400 grand your first year, but if you're smart, you're also not living crazy. Like I was living in an apartment that cost 1400 bucks a month for a long time and having roommates and stuff like that. When I when I, when I could have afforded otherwise, it's like, dude, when life throws you a fat pitch, you swing hard at it. So anyways, I think you're doing the right thing. I think there will be a tipping point where land becomes glaringly obvious, the opportunity vehicle, because there's no customers to service. It's very much direct response, but yours is a little more word of mouth or and there's benefits to pros and cons to both. One thing I want to say too, is you've, you've run ad campaigns in other industries through Facebook and Google. You also know that not every campaign hits, right? That's such a funny belief that people come in and it's just like, you know, you, every campaign works. It's like, no, we're playing a game of averages and some work and they work really well and some don't, but we still make money off of it. So talk to me about the first deal, A to Z. I know you documented it, but what was that journey like? And if I remember correctly, that was that deal in North Carolina we looked at, right? Is that yep, the same one? Yep. Cool, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. yep, How much well, mail have you sent in total too? How much mail did you send to get that deal? Uh, so that one, I believe it was uh, somewhere near 4,500. So I was basing it off of uh, kind of like your Leah framework of like every 2,500, you should land a deal. Now with that, I would say uh, there has a lot of that has changed in the land landscape and with all the stuff that you've built, not only within the course, but with the software that has definitely, uh, I would say, make improvements and I can see them not only one on like the responses that I've gotten, um, but with that, like, even leading into like this next mailer, it's like, it's even more refined where I can kind of see already the potential that that campaign has mm -hmm. based on like mm -hmm. the in-depth knowledge that I've learned from not only the course, but also like some of the coaches in there, like they drop so many yeah. nuggets. It's like, you, you have to kind of find them in the details of like how they're explaining things and um, how they operate their business. So when it comes to that first deal, I did it, you know, the original Leah way, like uh, I think the way you mentioned kind of like the free slash like VA version where you're going out on Redfin and you're scraping, you know, you're manually getting all those data points. So I, I right away, like my intuition was like, get a VA, get this out, get them to do it, you know, over, you know, a few days or two, give them, I, I think I gave them like a hundred markets based on, on that framework. And then it narrowed down to like, 
15 or 20, which has kind of been what's what's been penciling is like after you, you know, you kind of scrub, you go through the process, you figure out like, oh, okay, it's only like, you know, seven to 20 that actually are legit. And you kind of filter through them and you go through that process, but you kind of have to go through the process to dig and, um, you know, find out like what, what is the criteria. And that was another thing too, that got me a little stumped in the beginning is like, there was a, a wealth of knowledge that was dropped in that, that Leo course that it's just like, I was trying to get my footing out. Like, what is my niche? You know? So like yeah. the beginning phase, like that was more of like a spray and pray campaign. And I, I got one to land. So, um, from what I, what I found that I had a second mailer that I did a, somewhere around 4,500 and a bomb, but the responses were penciling in the same acreage range. So I, I focus on 10 to 20 acres right now. Um, okay. that's kind of like my sweet spot of what I found. And even like the type of, um, land owner that I, I can speak to. I feel like I can really resonate with them and speak to them. And it's a happy medium that works for me. So um, with that, it, that's what I found is like, I'm going to just stick with that. Um, because I, I found some of the other acreage ranges, I wasn't getting responses. Like, I don't know, you just kind of find out like what the feedback and that's another thing is going through this process is like, understanding the feedback loop and diving in that direction right because you're going to find trends you're going to find out what's your core bread and butter like i know some people do financing some people do like cash flips double closes all that which for me i was like scratch it we're just doing cash deals we're doing 10 to 20 and just double down on that so um it, with that first deal it was me going through all those uh you know like learnings i guess of trying to understand what well what is my niche in this land biz like you know uh going into like comparing that to, to digital marketing is the same thing right you have local legion you have e-commerce uh and then there's all a bunch of sub niches in between so i had to go through that with that biz so i'm like okay i gotta go through the same with this biz and this is where i was able to like i mentioned like the my experience has kind of like helped me but it's not a deal breaker if you are a new land investor um but it's just adopting that learning mindset and knowing that like like forever to be a student to be honest like you you have to always yeah. be learning and and um just taking that feedback is like this is not an l or a loss this is a learning experience and now yeah. that i know what i know i can go ahead and pivot or you know dive in a certain direction so um going back to that first land deal that's kind of how i went about like the mailer uh was just kind of like the manual process of like yeah. the google sheets finding the data points, <laughs> doing the mail. And it was very scrappy. And I was trying not to get too in the weeds with all the other strategies, like financing, all that. I was just like, nah, this is too much for me. Like, let me just do the, like what I need to get, you know, things going. So it's kind of like that 80, 20 rule. Um, if yeah. anyone's familiar with that, like the 80, 20 principle, like what's the, you know, what's the 20 or, uh, you know, what, what's the amount of effort that I need to put in that's going to give me 80% of the results. So yeah. Yeah, we it's funny. We I always recommend to everyone to do just an 80 20 analysis at the end of the year. Like go through all your deals and you do start to find weird commonalities. Now, I don't I typically don't go as narrow as just working in the you know preset acreage bracket, but I'll start to find commonalities for general size ranges. And it might be it's usually wider, maybe it's 10 to 100 acres. And as you start doing more deals, you'll recognize that uh, ultimately it's not a size thing. Typically, it might be price point related. It could be the accuracy of your pricing. Maybe you're better at pricing the 10 to 20s than you are the ones to twos, but it doesn't mean that ones to twos aren't, aren't leads that you can't deal with. It's just, you know, there might be something in your process that's going awry there. Um, could be just market related. could just be just a small sample size or at the core of it. Sometimes it's actually the persona that owns those properties and you, you gel well with the, pers the persona and the persona might be someone that just inherited the property. So the difference between a 20 acre and a 200 acre, it's really, you're speaking to the same person. You know what I mean? So, I recommend everyone do that. I think eventually as you go deeper in that, you'll probably branch out from 10 to 20. It's fine to be honed in from now, but you'll start to find other commonalities that are actually driving your results. Like the lady that sold you the land, how did she come to own it? Was it inherited? Was there any was there any story there that might stick out? Yeah, yeah. So uh, she was an, an older lady and she uh, had the land. Um, she was using it for like her cow business. So she owned like multiple mm -hmm. acres. She lived in like one of the neighboring parcels. Um, so yeah. she was mainly using that land for, uh, farmland. Um, so okay. she was at a point where she just needed some cash now. Like she was, it was like towards the end of the year and, you know, Christmas time, she was like, um, you know, I just kind of need to like pay some bills and get some cash for, uh, like a vacation. So we were mm -hmm. able to, you know, just kind of meet in the middle with like a price that worked, um, for both parties and, you know, we just kind of took it from there and ran it. But that was a yeah. process in itself is just 
trying to go about what fits like, you know, for the business in terms of uh, not only price point, but, you know, the type of parcel and then also what works for the seller, you know, like we can continue to re renegotiate and it, it could flop or we could renegotiate and they accept the deal and they're like, I'll take it. You know, like I, I don't have the time or uh, the capacity to go about, you know, listing the property myself. And that's a, a huge uh, value prop that comes with us yeah. going to the market and, and, you know, buying these uh, parcels is that we're able to provide the cash to them with little to no like headaches. You know, we just go yeah. about the process. Um, and then from there, they, they're able to get the cash fairly quick versus, you know, them having to do it themselves, connect with the real estate agent and, you know, go through or listing yeah. it, you know, their own selves and going through that process. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's just true. I'm taking this, this 80, 20 stuff to a whole other level. We're going through all the deals that we've ever done and we're running kind of like a psychographic analysis on all of those sellers. So everything, <laughs> what's the religious status? How much do they make? Do they rent? Do they own like all these data points? And trying to piece together commonalities we're working on something that's kind of cool that will in intertwine into land insights but um it's funny too because i mean i've gone through some of it and it's like man a lot of my preconceived notions as to why someone was a good fit was actually totally different than how i imagined like we always think about out of state or we always think about um uh that you know they've owned it for a long time but there's all these actually things that sit underneath it that drive motivation that we just can't see on the front end through like a data tree or, or a land vision or what have you um being on both sides right doing the manual mumbo jumbo for market selection and pricing using land insights talk to me about the difference there how has that kind of influenced your business and, and what, what does that look like and I, ultimately for me you can be as uh, unbiased as you want ultimately i just want to collect feedback more than anything yeah yeah so i would say you know with it being a a, a new software there are bugs you know and i think that comes with anything when you're starting something new is there's the kinks that need to get worked out and uh, I believe you transitioned a lot of the stuff, the feedback that we got from version one into this, and there will continue to be iterations where it'll be, you know, the next level. And I, I am a firm believer that land insights uh, will be a, you know, is a game changer for this. I believe a lot of the members have provided a lot of good feedback on how much time and, and money it saved. Um, even for myself, I calculated the numbers. I believe um, it's a, it's penciling about anywhere from like 20 to 30 percent or you know the inverse of that it's it's saving me about 70 to 80 percent of marketing costs if you really do the you know the numbers um not only the marketing cost but also time which that first mailer took me about uh anywhere from like two to two to three weeks to actually hash out go through it filter um dive into you know the those uh markets on redfin going about pricing um, so there's a lot that I've learned in that process the way, where it saved me so much time to get a, a mailer out. Like if I would have done the old method, which not saying the old method doesn't work because it obviously got me a deal, but uh, like with the software, it's able to expedite that. And I've been able to do it within days uh, versus like two and a half, three weeks, which is nuts. I'm like, wow. And I won't need to reach out to a VA, which like for me in that process of that first round of mailers, um it, it did take some time right like i had to connect with the va it will take them time because it's a lot of markets that we were trying to filter through um so i would have to like record a video give them a criteria go through it then i would have to go in and like filter all the you know all the metrics myself highlight them and then go through pricing and then even that like once you go into pricing you're like okay this market doesn't fit because it doesn't meet my buy box so yeah. Uh, circling back to like uh, what I was mentioning, like, I, yeah, I focus on 10 to 20, but I also expand based on that. Like if I do see a market that is still hot, but the buy box still meets my criteria, oh, I will reach to like, you know, the zero to fives or like, uh, you know, we'll do the 20 to 40s, you know, if I see it fit. And it's like, it makes sense. If it's hot enough, then it's like, why not? You know, you really have nothing else to lose. If the math is there, hey, the confidence is in the, that comes with that is in the market research. Yep. And I would say like Land Insights definitely does that. Um, yeah, unbiased. I would say the only thing that I, I've really had issues with it is the, um, is like the little bug issues. I believe I had some issues with like the payments and whatnot. So I was just working through it, but it comes with it. Like people that are new to understanding that uh, is like, it, it comes with it, you know, with it being yeah. fairly new. Not saying yeah. that it's 100% new, but it's like, 
these are iterations that you will continue to find. And, and I'm sure there's more features that will pop up, which is very exciting. But yeah. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it is new. It's even, it's still, it's less than a year old, which, which is crazy because it does feel like it's been around for, for a lot longer. But it, it, in reality, it's actually three months old. And what I mean by that is Nuts, the first, man. whatever, eight months or so, because we haven't hit a year yet. It was built on top of Tableau, which is just a database, right? So it wasn't even really a software. It was just uh, amassing this data, putting it into a database, and then you could kind of toy around, manipulate it. But ultimately, the tool has been its like been in its own form since March 27th. And that's when we moved over to our own user interface. And what's interesting is that like we know the problems to solve, and we've got a litany of things that people don't know about that we're working on behind the scenes. A lot of the stuff that we're actually using in our land business today that we haven't released publicly yet. So there's a slew of things that go way beyond market selection and scrubbing, but we also don't know Jack's crap about building software. So it's like, we know the problem and we know how to solve it roughly in a perfect world, but there definitely has been a lot of tripping and fumbling to try to um, you know, build a tool that, that runs smoothly. And it, it made running, building software and running a software business is unlike anything I've ever done before. So it's been a really fun challenge in a lot of ways. What's crazy though is despite the whoopsies and especially the first eight months, I mean, that we've come a long way from Tableau to where we are now, there's still hiccups with some scrubbing and some Stripe stuff. And there's just some annoying little idiosyncrasies, login issues, small, small bugs, but they, they are annoying. And we release new patches every Monday and every Wednesday. So we're pumping out every week new patches. And those patches either come off of the feedback requests from users or just things that we're seeing. And we're launching major updates about every four weeks, which is an incredible development timeline. That's that's freaking breakneck speeds. Um, what was I going to say? Um, oh, yeah. Despite all the, the hiccups and the annoyances, it's crazy that it still presents the value that it does. And that tells you that, wow, it's a noble problem to solve. On average, our users are doubling their ROAS, so 91.67% increase in ROAS. So if you're at 10x, hypothetically, I'm going to like under 20x, which is insane. These aren't folks that are brand spanking new, too. Most of these people are three months to a couple years in the land. The, all the this time saving stats 33% increase in, in response rate, 79% uh, offer accuracy, which is like a jump of 40% compared to before and after. So the stats are immense. It's pretty cool to see the, the, the difference. And ultimately, if someone wanted to go and collect that data through a VA just for the market selection data, it's about $17,000 a month just to re replicate that data. But here's the crazy thing the crazy, and that's just, just for one person to have access to it. The crazy thing is that, like, I, I, I was running the same setup, the same setup that you tried in the beginning of having a VA do a lot of this work. And I probably went a little wider than you did. I really tried to send them to grab a lot of markets. The problem is, if A, it's complex and people are hard to manage. I would always take code over the complexity of a person. But I didn't even realize it at the time. There was such a selection bias of me pointing them in a certain direction for them to start. I don't know if that makes sense. But the real uh, value of Land Insights is not just the time savings. It's you put in your parameters and it scours the US to find things that you would never otherwise find. And so yeah. I would tell them, go pull every county in Colorado. And I wasn't thinking about upstate New York or fill in the blank. You know what I mean? So my own bias got in the way of me finding what we call these honey holes. Dude, I know a guy that made a million dollars in profit in six months from one, one county, one honey hole. And it's just the most off the beaten path, bizarre place. And that's the real, that's been the real like, kind of sauce for me, both on the zip code level and the county level, which has been really, really cool. Um, it sounds like you're also scrubbing all of your data. So that's where you're getting the, the huge reduction in marketing costs. Is that true? Uh, so I'm actually just wrapping that up, but I'm sure that's going to cut it down even more um, because I, okay. I've been able to, it's a, it was a bit of a learning curve uh, trying to understand the zip codes um, yeah. and how to go about that and, and play around with like the UI of like adding zip codes in like certain uh, in like your my markets uh, section. So yeah. um, there's all these like little learning curves that come about using the software, which also kind of slow things down. But once you get it, it's a wrap. Like you're like, okay, this is the process now. Now we're, you know, we're adopting this and we're moving forward. Um, now that I've already kind of set up my foundation and framework and got an understanding of it, um, it man, we should be flying off with, you know, campaigns uh, way faster than before. Um, but I would say, yeah, that that's been like the main thing is like the 80, 20 is that it's, it, it's saving a, a lot of that. Like you said, there's a lot of markets that I uncovered that I'm like, wow, I, I never dove into these. And sometimes it, 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 uh, it also helps for like revisiting old markets that I was diving into, like, oh, they really weren't as hot as I anticipated. Uh, but then a lot of things that come with that is like, there's market shifts that, that come in to play with that too. Like, kind of like how you, I think you've mentioned in previous videos is like the markets change. And like you said, you, you might, uh, narrow in on like one thing, but really there's still like other things to unpack 
in, in the markets, uh, you know, going through them. So, yeah, Dude, you know, there's there's so many sub niches and sub strategies, even just within Land Insights. It, it's almost overwhelming. Like we get to see how people use the tool and there's entitlers, subdividers, uh, infill people, so many little sub niches. And I think that can be overwhelming. And so one of the things that we're doing uh, actually this month, I believe it's, let me find the date here. I believe it's on the 20th. Uh, yeah, the 20th of this month at 4 p.m. PST. We're uh, hosting a website or a website, a webinar. You don't have to be a Land Insights user. You can or you can't. Either way is fine. But we're actually going to go and unearth all the sub techniques and sub strategies that we found from our users on the tool. So like, here's how we would use it to find subdivisions. Here's how we would use it to do infill flips. Here's how we would do it to do subdivides and going through and showing all those little intricate strategies, which is going to be freaking dope. And even if you're not a landing sites user, you're still going to learn a thing or two that you could just replicate on your own. Like I just did a webinar for landing sites last week. And I really try to keep it where it's like, I'm going to show you how the tool can do it, but I'm also going to show you how you could do this on your own. Right. So ultimately the takeaway from this webinar is how to two extra marketing turn while buying back 20 plus hours per week. Landinsights.co slash webinar. I'll put that somewhere in the in the doobly do for you guys. But um, that answer would probably be a good webinar for you to go to as well. I think it's too much. It's just like Leah. It's like too difficult to learn all that information through a course. And so one of the things that we just launched, not to go off the rails here, but we just launched, which you'll get access to actually today, Victor, is a Discord that's built just for Land Insights users uh, with support in there. So really tight feedback loop for questions or people sharing strategies or feedback or support requests. Uh, obviously, we do our once a month uh, Land Insights call, which is actually happening today. Um, we just added onboarding calls for all new members and then we're rebuilding out our program. And so just trying to create better support. One of the things that we're doing too, is when folks sign up now, they're going to, there's going to kind of like an automated onboarding helper that's going to make you go through the tool and, and learn each bucket of the tool. And it's going to actually hold your hand and walk you through it because it is, it can be overwhelming. And just like with Leah, it's like, if you don't implement the thing, you don't get the results. One thing to like watch the modules and stuff, but implementation is where you put rubber to the road and that's where the magic happens. Uh, let's zoom out from land inside stuff. Let's talk about just from, from your own comparing and contrasting. So we got the two folks that joined Lee are a either W two worse, which you were at one point, but I consider you more of a, a business owner than anything. And then we get business owners and most of those folks are like either never done land or they're like 24 months or less in the land kind of dipping their toe in the pond, but they usually have something else going on and they're looking to do this full time. So being on both sides of the pond, having a, a marketing business and land, Compare and contrast. What are the differences? What model do you see yourself sticking with long term? What do you like about each? What do you not like? I think there's a lot of people that are in your shoes. Even if they're not running a marketing agency, they're running some other opportunity. I don't think anything compares to land, but I'm curious to get your your, your thoughts. Yeah, um, I do foresee. You know, the future for me is is definitely land. Um, not only the margins, but like for me, I never really had the opportunity to run like a like a full fledged business. I've been kind of like in and out of freelancing, like just myself, you know, just basically yeah. me, uh, selling, you know, and, and not, not only doing the selling, but like doing the implementation, doing the calls, doing it, you know, so I never had the uh, true opportunity to run like an ops biz. Um, yeah. but with that, I think, uh, for me, you know, the marketing stuff is, it's awesome. I, I love it. I still do. Um, I think it's just in terms of scale. And I, I think I have like a bigger vision, uh, in terms of like where I see myself land definitely fills that in terms of, you know, what we can do and, uh, the capacity that it can handle. Um, because I, I did learn, you know, in and out of agencies and working in house, um, you know, there's, there's only so much that I feel like I would be comfortable scaling with the, the digital marketing stuff where, um, I never really got to dive into like a single niche. I've kind of worked with like local legion, e-com coaches, stuff like that. And um, I think I kind of like not lost motivation for it, but um, I, I don't see myself growing that biz completely. Just seeing like, not like what it takes, but I don't know. It's just after I got to experience uh, the process of going through land, uh, I, I do like the, the margins a ton and I do see myself running like a full fledged business a lot faster, right? Because like, once you have that form of capital, you can actually bring in, uh, better, um, better talent. Like you can start bringing on employees within end of year one, which is crazy. Like with marketing, I've been sticking with it and really just trying to get my groove, but I, I can see already the direction with like kind of the wins that I've had 
with land, I can actually run an, an operation, which that's been like my main goal is, is trying to get there. I've been doing it all this time with digital marketing and it's, I, you know, I fell short, but I, I definitely can see, you know, it, it done. I'm not saying that it can't be done in digital marketing, but I, I think I just kind of fell in love with land, to be honest. Um, land, it, it just, it's weird. I never thought I'd fall in love with dirt. Uh, I think like for you, you mentioned it, uh, you know, a while back when we first, you know, got started, both you and I, like me, when we met, I was barely getting started in my digital marketing, like career as a whole. Uh, and then you stuck with land and that was like ages ago, you know? So I, I kind of beat myself sometimes. I, I beat myself up like, dang, it, had I like just dove in it with, uh, you know, Sumner at that time, I probably would have been light years ahead. But also I, I've learned a lot in between doing the digital marketing stuff where I feel like if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have adopted that mindset and going through those, you know, hiccups with digital marketing. Um, I feel like if I didn't have those learnings, then I'd be at a different place in my land biz. But For sure. For who knows? Sure. I mean, it's a lot of coulda, woulda, shouldas, but hey, yeah. Yeah, just kind of learn and adapt and and just continue to move on. So yeah, that's for yeah. me, that's my main goal is running in operations. Like that's that's been huge. Uh, and I got to do that at the previous agency I worked for um, a little bit, but uh, with that, it would be nice to like run a full-fledged team. And like, I kind of have the vision of how I would run it too. It's just having the capital. Once the capital is there and we have actual uh, inflow of like consistent cash flow, then I can start bringing people on, which I already have, you know, a few people in mind to, to bring into the biz. Yeah. So. I actually have like some friends and family that are interested in it. But like you said, if they don't have that like itch, that entrepreneurial itch, which for some of you, if you're in your W-2 and you haven't uh, kind of had a taste of that, it's kind of hard to describe. But like once yeah. you get your first one, it's like you're hooked. You you don't go back, to be honest. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of why like I've still I failed uh, a lot throughout these years. Like I mentioned, like going back to W-2 and then doing this again and going back. This is my second go around going full time on my own. So I definitely have approached it a little differently. And um, now it's just like, okay, now we transition out, we're going to transition into land. So it's like you said, you can't really cut off your previous thing completely uh, till you have like at the foundational set with the new venture. So for me, yeah, it's been like no. W2 digital marketing freelance. And then it's like, we, we transition into land. So for me, I've, yeah. you know, just kind of like bounce back and forth from all those. But the long term vision is to like go all in with land and see if I can adopt or implement some of these digital marketing strategies that I, I kind of have running like the local legion stuff uh, to that, which I can see feasible. Um, but it, it's a matter of testing, right? There's so many ways that we can go about testing that it is going to require a, a good chunk of capital to kind of like test these different iterations. And now that you have, uh, you know, access to um, the skip tracing, which I, I'm sure there was other softwares out there. But with skip tracing, it's like it, it definitely changes the game because now you can actually hit a list as like a retargeting campaign. You know, like you, you'd probably do like your standard mail, text, email, and then that could be your, 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 you know, your fourth uh, channel is like, yeah, once you have like a proof of concept, I would foresee that as being another leg that you can add on. But like for me, yeah. first things first is just sticking to mail. Uh, I definitely don't see myself testing that out yet till I get all the other foundations and we just have flow. So that's kind of like where I'm at, like mentally with, you know, running marketing channels for my business. Yeah. yeah I think uh, for everyone that's watching this in the beginning of your land journey, it's like one strategy, one marketing channel, just one maniacal focus. And then you get that thing working and starting a new marketing channel is almost like starting a new business. So it's like, I'm very, even though there's a lot of ways that you can make money, especially with your skill set, I think it's wise just to hone in on one. One thing I want to say too, just for everyone here, this is just a personal belief, but it's like, I believe that we all have free will and we make choices and they have an effect. But I also believe that it's all in due time. Like everyone's got their timing. And for anyone here that's kicking themselves because they're whatever, 45 years old and they want to get started earlier, it's like, fuck that. It's all in due time. Whatever that timeline looks like for you, you're, I believe everyone's exactly where they need to be at the right moment. I just saw this girl in Leah who's 15 years old or who started land investing at 15. Now she's 18. So yeah, there's folks that started way earlier than you. People started way earlier than me. And that's okay. It's all in due time. So you don't beat yourself up and anyone watching this, don't beat yourself up. We got folks inside of Leah. We had, we had someone that was 80 years old join Leah. We got folks that are 21 years old. So you can do it at any any stage in your life. Um, I want to just double click on one thing and then we can kind of turn the, flip the mic and you can grill me any land questions that you have. But you say run an operation. 
why do you want to do that? <laughs> I've been on the other side of that, and I, I'm just curious what 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 attracts you to it because it comes with uh, it comes with a lot. Yeah, uh, I think with that, I, I think I've got over being like the solo business owner, and mm -hmm. like for me, it's been a lot of fun working with very like minded individuals, whether them like being entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs themselves, bringing them in as full on partners. Um, but I had a lot of fun. I have an experience with, you know, a buddy of mine, like we, we've worked together on a lot of cool stuff and that like sparked something where I was like, man, this is what I was looking for. I was actually like trying to figure out like, you know, these last few years of being in and out of like digital marketing and like, you know, doing the land on the side is like figuring out like, what do I want to do and what really gets me excited? And it's working with people that you actually genuinely like want like to be in your corner but not only that but you guys also have the same mission like i like for me i think that's really what i've been trying to do and that's kind of like why i moved to san diego is like i was looking to find like my crew or like uh, like find like-minded individuals which you know where i'm at here in chicago i mean a lot of people are just we're just kind of brought up that way to be like a fireman a policeman which there's no no knock on that i mean that's that's cool and all because we do definitely need like people like that in the world, doctors, you know, et cetera. But for me, I was really, I, I had a void of finding like, like-minded individuals, whether that being other entrepreneurs. And that's why I appreciate the discord group. Cause we're all like, everyone is so awesome in there and like sharing resources and like giving a helping hand wherever, you know, needed. Uh, so it's been really awesome building relationships in there. And, and for me, that's, that's really, you know, what stems from it is like building the ops is building my own kind of like, business of like-minded individuals uh that are all on the same mission and we can all work together because it gets lonely doing this stuff by yourself like don't get me wrong i, I love my client my my clients are awesome but uh there's something else to it when you have like people in your corner and you're like working together on a strategy to like get to the next level and the next level and like bring more people on and you guys all vibe which i'm sure you have i i believe you mentioned in your business like i thought that was so cool you were able to like meet them uh meet them up and like you guys have a you know a ball and like just kind of talk shop outside of like business and work and stuff like that um for me that's where i see i'm like damn like this is what i i've needed and i got a taste of that through working in and out of agencies is like that's that's what i want so for me it's not so much of like the pain of like doing the stuff of like the ops and say, you know that comes with it is like selling, setting up sops and you know frameworks and whatnot but that's also for me like uh, the next level in entrepreneurship is getting to that, which I, I've been, you know, in the solo seat for a while, which I see a lot of land investors there, there. And I, I think that's cool. I mean, they, they love it. But, um, for me, it's like, I, I, I genuinely like want my own team. Uh, like yeah. I, I kind of crave that, I guess that's where I I've been looking to, to fill and I found it. So that's kind of, that aligns with like my long-term vision. Yeah, no, I totally understand that. And, uh by ops i knew you didn't mean sops and operations i just think that like I, I, there's a a lust in most entrepreneurial circles and i think it's changing to have a big team it's kind of like the, the thing that everyone flexes like i got 50 employees you know whatever like everyone likes to, to kind of drop that uh and it's a huge feat yeah. and it's a huge accomplishment and there it, there's a real beauty to having a tribe that you go to battle with every day and you're in the trenches and there's a shared mission and there's a bond and there's a camaraderie and that is amazing and honestly and when you're in the solopreneur seat that that is the most lust worthy thing ever and there's a real benefit to it especially i think if you can have that to where you're in person one of my biggest business regrets is not hiring locally like if i could go back and do it other, over again i actually would not go remote team ever again <laughs> i would go local without a shadow of a doubt and i would float the cost of a small office space well, three four grand a month i think we get that uh, in a productivity boost that it's a huge roi for the investment of an office i do think there's going to be a time where people will realize that remote work is kind of bullshit. the whole separate thing mm -hmm. but what i was going to say is what i've gone through personally is that like building a big team and building it with, with a couple of different businesses you do start to build a jail for yourself i, I talked about i was talking about this on our leah call last night it's this golden prison that you build where having a big team adds a lot of complexity and there's a lot of management and there's that all falls back on you and mm -hmm. there's inter-tribal feuds and there's just there's just so much that happens that you think oh i'm gonna build this team and then i'm piecing out and and then i'm not really a part of it 
And there's a scale where that makes sense. You bring in an interim CEO or COO and you kind of sit more like a board member. But for most folks that are sub 50 employees, that scale just doesn't exist depending on the business model. And so it's like this really awkward, like from 10 to whatever, 30 people, man, it's just, it's complex. And so my, my whole thing nowadays that I've been, the drum that I'm beating is revenue per employee. I want highly productive, highly connected teams, but small teams. And I love yep. my new business fetish is like five person business does 15 million a year. Like those are the businesses. And that's both partially a business model thing, but it's also a culture on who you hire and how you hire. And I think reframing that big team does not mean big success. Big team means big complexity. You know what I mean? You look at some of these companies like, like Facebook that have a hundred thousand employees or Google, it's just like, it's just so much bloat, you know, and some businesses yep. have enough margin to where you can do that. But I think it's rarely needed. So anyway, it's just been my, my learning, but I, I do agree. I think sitting on the solopreneur side, it gets lonely. My recommendation for everyone, if you are a solopreneur or maybe you want to be a solopreneur, I also am fascinated by one person businesses. I think that's fascinating. You still need community, but ideally in person at worst, virtually. And you're inside of Leah. And the honest truth is though, you could, you probably should spend more time. And I know you've got a lot of things on your plate. I'm not shaming you, but I think it does. There's a feel that you get the four minute mile syndrome of seeing other people doing the thing that you're doing that maybe are one step ahead of you or just had a big win or share something with you that to me, it just builds this momentum and it builds this excitement. And I think as a guy, maybe as a girl too, kind of pulls a little bit of competition out and you kind of like, I don't know, just change the dynamic. So at worst, I think folks need to be inside a community, especially for land. Land is the most isolated, <laughs> bizarre business because you can't talk about it with anyone because no one understands it. So. Anyways, man, have you met any friends out of Leah or have you met any people in person or made connections? Uh, not yet. I think because everyone's kind of so spread out uh, in person. Uh, but I, I have met, uh, you know, kind of like my core two, three people in the group where uh, we just kind of chat. Like, you know, I, it, I've also reconnected uh with a few others where we were kind of like doing the same things at one point in our entrepreneurial mm. journeys and they stumbled on land yeah. i'm like that's yeah. so interesting so i'm kind of seeing this trend of like uh people on the digital side whether they're going through like a mentorship or uh yeah. they just kind of like stumbled on your content coming in uh, the space too which is really awesome and I, I think that's where we're able i'm able to make connections uh on that part is like meeting people that are, you know, not only like-minded, but we've had like similar experiences. I think there's something yeah. to that, that works it like, wow, we've kind of done the the same stuff. Like let's kind of chat yeah. and uh, catch up. So for me, I'm always about just kind of throwing it out there. Like, Hey, let's, you know, meet and connect. And, you know, if we meet, we meet, if not, you know, no harm, no yeah. foul, but yeah. yeah. Uh, going back have to the to a guy stuff, named, uh, sorry, sorry, Victor. have you talked to a guy named Cole, Cole Sundum? Cole? No, I haven't chatted with Cole yet. Uh, I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a prompt you. I recommend reaching out. Talk about similar-ish journey and story. I think you guys would really get along. Um, marketing guy, go high, go high level guy, automations guy. Like you guys, I don't know. You just kind of come from a similar domain. I think you had a W two, but was freelancing and it just got into land like like a year ago or something. Joined Leah maybe two three months ago. Um, very similar journey, I think at least. And he still does some freelancing on the side. I don't know. It would be would be, would be a good guy to talk to um for sure, for sure yeah and are you coming to the mastermind this year uh this year uh i don't know if i'm gonna make it i think right now it's just funds are a little tight just uh with the biz and then waiting for you know the that land to actually flip so yeah. once all the expenses are kind of crunched out i'll see if i i can definitely make it the goal is to like i really am itching to i know last year it was uh i got married so that that was the time of the event it was during my my wedding so that's another thing is like uh go, time, going back to business like i've had a lot of life events that kind of came up it's like you know it, it you know it's it's i wouldn't say it's like uh like a hold back up but it's one of those things where life kind of happens and it's like we got to kind of take a pause right now you know during the yeah. season enjoy it and then we get back into it you know yeah so. What, what yeah. about this? What if, if I comped your ticket? Would you come? Oh, most definitely. Yeah, I definitely slide okay. through it for sure. Okay, let's do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll send another team. Because there's nothing really holding me back. I mean, I'm free as a bird. I think you need to come. That's just the honest. That, that's the honest take. I think for where you're at, it's rocket fuel. The amount of people last year that were six months to a year in who have followed up, and some of them are really members, some are, and said that was the inflection point. 
is i mean dozens of people and again it kind of goes back to what i was saying even just with the discord thing it's like just seeing people and communicating with people that are just just a little bit ahead of you it just makes it real dude when you talk to someone that just had their second year made a million dollars or made 500k their first year whatever like i don't know to me it really for me at least it like resets what i feel is possible for myself and the real beauty i think is like not even just the guest speakers and and that it's like the connections that you make and the connections that you take and so people leave when they're in group chats or whatever i, just, I don't know it's just a lot of value to it and we've had so many folks from that meetup stem and create their own subgroups in leo or even people make like sub meetups through Leah that meet up in New Jersey or Florida or whatever. So it's just a beautiful thing. I'm going to send a note right now. I really, from the bottom of my heart, I, I think you need to be there. I want you to be there. And I think, I think it, it would be rocket fuel. So let, let me leave a note right now. I'll make sure that, that you get added to the list. Um, I appreciate that, man. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, that. of course. Let's, uh, let's flip the script. Questions for me, land stuff, business stuff, wherever you want to go. What do you got? yeah um okay so first thing for me is been uh going about marketing when you have like a tight cash flow so going back to kind of like the direction that i i've been going with you know choosing markets and whatnot a lot of it is tied to like marketing costs you know and a lot of that that i've i've used has been you know from my my previous w2 that i've been funneling into funding like the markets and whatnot now that i don't have that i've been kind of like gradually growing my marketing biz and using some of the extra rev for that. Um, I, I have in the past floated it, you know, on a credit card, but now that that's going to, you know, return, it's going to make yeah. a return now. So like, it's funny, like, you know, I've been kind of like holding off these last few months from that campaign. And it's like trying to figure out how I can just move the, the needle forward with some more like leaner cost strategies. So um for me that's that's what's been a, a hard part is like trying to figure out how to make that push with limited mm -hmm. capital that's kind of like where yeah. i've been i mean the good news is you actually don't need as much capital as people think right and you're about to you spent whatever 2500 maybe three thousand bucks in marketing to get that that one deal right and so you're about to get mm -hmm. a, a nice influx back in the business my recommendation would be to snowball that back in the business exclusively i mean pay yourself back but I would put it back into the business. But even with that, I, I still think I would operate as if I only have like 10 grand to survive in this business for the next 90 days at every junction. And I've actually mm -hmm. found the folks that are are lean, like not too lean, like you can't run this business with a thousand dollars. But yeah. folks that are lean, like seven to 15 grand, they make the best decisions. And one of the best decisions that you can make that I would just go and first probe and ask yourself is, are you absolutely at 100% max uh, work ethic or input on your acquisition process? Because if you're not, that's the first thing I would be doing from it before I even think about sending out more marketing. I see a lot of folks that just, they're only taking the layup deals that come to them and they're on this game of always marketing more just to take the lowest hanging fruit. And there's just stacked value sitting in their CRM. I mean, I could probably go take 100 LEA members right now, go through all of their CRMs and probably pick out two to $5 million worth of deals. No bullshit. And people are just looking for the dead obvious. And we always say that this is a sales and marketing business, but I've really changed my tune on that the last couple of years since running Leah and seeing the back end of people's businesses. It's like, this is 10% marketing and 90% sales. Sales is the force multiplier here. Sales is how we can go into your CRM and go make you an extra 30K the next 90 days from deals that already exist without spending more on marketing. So before we talk about any of the marketing stuff, are you absolutely maxing out what you can do on acquisitions, both in terms of you know, following our 14 day seller, seller follow up cadence, following our call flow, following how we make offers, having you know, context based follow up sequences once you talk to the lead? Like, are you doing all of that? No, I, I would say to that, I probably have like uh, a few that I have bucketed into that that follow the criteria. I think because a lot of them were just kind of like dead properties, there was too many wetlands, stuff like that. But there are probably like, five to 10 that I could be following up with. So definitely getting that in play. That's what I have in the works right now. I'm bringing on a partner actually, kind of like what like uh, Dennis and Rob, I believe they they kind of started as a partnership. So I'm, I, I'm going to be taking that approach where yeah, I'll be splitting profits, but I'll be bringing on more of an A player. So going back to like what we were talking about teams is my goal is to like bring in just straight A players where I won't have to manage them. Cause I've had to do deal in the past with like, VAs and those that aren't really uh, not qualified, but 
there's a lot of hand holding that you would need to do. I'd rather pay someone a little more, give them more free reign and, and a decent, like give them an incentive uh, where, you know, we're all, but we're also all on the same page, right? We're like, okay, this aligns with me. This aligns with us. Uh, we can work together and just kind of work with like a team of just straight A players. So going back, like what you were saying is like, maybe have a, a, a strong, you know, a starting five where it's your core five and we're all working on the same mission. Um, someone working on ops, whether that's me doing market and sales, and then the rest is like, uh, I don't know what other roles would kind of fall in between, but you know, when it comes to, to that point, you know, I'll just kind of figure out what seats I need to fill after I kind of max out my capacity in the biz. Uh, what, what is the person's role going to be? Uh, they would be mainly handling like that, like the like the acquisition, follow up, doing essentially like the GHL stuff while I'm doing like the marketing. So they'll be doing the like the follow up, uh, maybe some of the scrubbing. I don't know what all the details look like. I still got to kind of hash that out. Um, but from what I know, it's getting all the tech and all that set up on the back end and continuing to, to run that, which I don't know if it involves that much time. But uh, I would assume once we have some flow coming in. Uh, there will be a need to constantly nurture uh, those sequences. And for me, uh, like the the skip tracing has been a, a bit of a game changer. It's like, wow, I could actually be uh, sending follow-up emails and texts. Uh, I don't know if you do that uh, first versus doing mail. I, I Like everyone's strategies are different, but I see that as a like a leaner way to go about like, you know, going after markets. Um, and we probably would spend like a fraction of the costs doing that uh, instead of mail. But I would still see mail as like the main bread and butter. So I don't know, just trying to yeah. kind of figure that out. That's where I'm still like in the early stages of trying to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. It goes back to what I was saying before, just one marketing channel. There's a lot of ways you can touch leads. Just stick with one. Don't think about adding anything until you've really not maxed it out. You don't have to truly max it out, but until that, it's a system that hums on its own and you're, it's consistently bringing revenue in. And then you can support making hires because every other marketing channel is going to require someone to run them. Uh, what's the compensation look like for this guy? Uh, I I don't yet. I don't know yet. Like I've been just kind of like dabbling with the idea. I just don't know. I know like you mentioned in the past, like splitting profits, making a percentage for like everyone. So like a percentage of me, percentage for them. And then the rest goes into the biz. Um, but I just don't know. Like I mentioned, I'm still new to like getting something like that set up. But yeah. also like being fair, I think that's where I've struggled with is like transitioning out. And this is what I was mentioning is like those learnings of transitioning out of like a solopreneur and getting more into like building a team. Like what is what is those like payouts, incentives that that, that yeah. structure look like? So that's where I don't know. And that's where, you know, I would probably gain a ton of value going to the, you know, the Leah meetup. Uh, to yeah, kind of like sure. on how everyone operates their business, because I, I really don't know. Like that's a huge unknown. But this is what I'm like was tying back to is like this is like the next level of entrepreneurship now is like setting that out yeah. it's not just paying me and a few softwares and you know maybe getting cashed out for a deal it's like now we're bringing in people like how do how do we do yeah. that yeah i mean did a lot a lot to give or a lot to share a i would not make anyone partner or give them equity even it's just not needed this is a business that just doesn't need a partner so that's the first thing there's still ways to bring them in and get them compensated well but i would not have any kind of where hey we're 50 50 partners uh, automation plays such a small role in this business that it's like, that's a one time set and forget thing. It really, this is very much an on the phone voice to voice. I was going to say belly to belly, but it's not belly to belly, but like the magic does not happen through automated texts and emails. It helps, especially as you build up a big pipeline and you're working dead leads. It's great in the very beginning when a lead comes in and it's great when they go dead, but that middle is all manual. And it's, it's that context-based context -based, follow-up approach that's high touch that wins us deals. Um, mm -hmm. So you can definitely pay some, I just pay someone a one-off fee to set that up. And there's really the the uh, managing of that long-term is, is, is pretty much zero. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if you're running cold text campaigns and, and cold calling, that's a whole separate thing. And, that, and that's touching on the yeah. marketing. But what we're talking about here is just related to the acquisitions. Um, you know, if you brought someone, I, I actually would like to zoom out. I think it's too soon to even be thinking about truly hiring people. So obviously you don't want any hit to your payroll. I think the other thing yeah. is that you haven't gone full cycle on enough deals. And I don't think you're maxing out what exists now to be able to fully manage someone. So if you brought someone in as an acquisition person, because you're not, and you don't have to be at the highest level, but you're not, you know, there's still a lot of room for you to get more experience there. I find yeah. when people hire too soon, especially for things that they don't like, which that's always the adage is like, 
delegate the things you hate, but I think you got to do the things you hate first to learn how to train and manage and lead someone and understand like, are they doing good? Are they doing bad? And I see folks that come into Leah that have money that try to hire like right off the rip, like three, four months in, and they don't, they're hiring so that they're, they have a, they're really opposed to doing a part of the business. And it's either mailers or it's either on the phone. And it never has worked. It's, I literally, it crashes and burns. So, um, and it's not to say you can't bring someone in. Now, what I have seen that does work is bringing people in either, I've seen Leah members partner up on certain deals. So it's on a deal by deal basis. Yo, I'm swamped. I got this crazy op. You run point on it. We'll split this deal 50-50. I think that's really fair. And so okay. on a deal by deal basis, I prefer deal by deal partnerships more than anything else. Or you bring people in and you just say, hey, you can you can have at my CRM and any lead you take down, I'll give you whatever, 10, 20% of the, of the gross profit. I'll fund it. I'll fund marketing. I'll run all that. You just can help out in their CRM. And so they're almost like a intern that has a stake in, in doing deals. And it's not deal by deal. It's any deal that they, they can go and revive or do. And we have a lot of folks that pull, even they're not from Leah, but from the Leah Discord or our YouTube channel that like no land, but don't want to run their own business. That's That's been a great setup. Something that we've done as well. You call it like an intern kind of. Okay. Um, okay. But again, even to, even to have that be successful, you've got to have enough reps under your belt to actually know because very few people, unless they're a Leah member, are going to come trained out of the box. Uh, and even in that dynamic, you're probably still the leader, even if you're partnering on a deal by deal basis, because you're the one bringing the lead source and the opportunity. And so you have to know the right and the wrong, the black and the white to have context and like, yo, this person sucks <laughs> what they're doing. Right. So anyways, what I would, what I would recommend prior to that is like, before you even think about more marketing, go through the acquisition modules, go through the acquisition SOPs and just replicate as much as you can. I know some of it's not attainable. You're not full-time in this business. I understand. We're going to have to cut you some slack in some areas. But there yeah. should be, you should be keeping the ball in motion with every single warm lead that you have. And you should, when a new lead comes in, you are maximizing to get the highest pickup rate. Because I'm sure you've seen this leads reach out and they never get back to you. What's well, like, yeah. are you continuing to work that lead? Because if we can go from 70% of the people that pick up the phone to 90% of the people that pick up the phone, you're going to do more deals just, just by proxy of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like the really low hanging fruit. And that's how we, there's folks that are doing crazy numbers with little marketing spend. Um, the other thing on the same vein though, they're psychotic about being a sniper. Like I think we already kind of take that sniper ethos in Leah, but take that to the next, next level where you're scrubbing like whatever, 60%, 70% of your data inside of land insights. You're just taking shots on goal, like for deals that are right in your wheelhouse. You know how to talk the lingo. You're, you're removing all the junk, all the fluff. Like if it's got more than 50% white lens, Victor probably doesn't want to touch it. So let's not even market to it in the beginning. And so you might only be sending out 2000 mailers a month, but they're shots on goal. And yeah, you might get four or five leads, but you're, you're extracting a deal or two out of that if your acquisition process is airtight. Most people just won't do that though, because it's not it, it's not action packed. You know, what's action packed and what feels like progress is going from five thousand to ten thousand mailers a month. But it's like let's just focus on quality over quantity, especially if you're on a tight budget. Um, and there's so many people I can speak to that have done that. Like that that is the way. But even beyond that, just as a generalization. Dude, focus on acquisitions. Like that is mm -hmm. the life button. Mm -hmm. How many leads do you have in your CRM right now? Uh, right now, they're all old. So I probably have about 13, 13 like okay. old dead leads. Cool. And but if you had a so, guess. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, you're good. You're uh, good. Like, like if I had to get like from the ones that I saw that, the, you know, we probably had a conversation and they flopped. Like there's definitely follow up on those that I haven't done. Um, yep. so like I mentioned, there's still a lot that I have to do on that part. And maybe too, it's revisiting all those markets and cherry picking the ones, like maybe scrubbing, uh, that list to find like, okay, these are good properties that I actually would go after. I've gotten a deal here. Let's try to find yep. like neighboring markets and just, there's yep. still a lot of untapped value probably in what I have sitting in, uh, like, you know, my initial exported list from data tree, you know, so yeah. that, that going back to your point, um, yeah, that definitely is brought to my attention now. Like I'm, I'm probably sitting on a lot of dollars that like yeah. is already there. Uh, like you mentioned, yeah. dude, most people are, and most people, they fail to realize that the, the, the magic happens by working the lead. Like some leads come to you and it's a layup and you can build a business off of it, but it's not the proper way to build a business off of it. And I don't think everyone realizes that like, dude, doing a deal is like going to war both for like, 
problems that you have to overcome on the property and objections to work the seller and just a sales cycle to get a deal done. I mean, we've got deals that knock on wood that will come around this year or next year that will take two years to do. And if you looked at our CRM, you'd be just your jaw would hit the floor. <laughs> There's 100 phone calls, 500 texts, 100 emails. Like we just, you just that, that tenacity. But to do that, you need a system. And the system already exists. So it's just about making sure that you're implementing the system. And once you've done that, bringing someone in makes a lot more sense because now you can plug them in and they're going to hit the ground running. But I still would be very mindful about how you compensate them. And do the thing is, someone if you give someone 10% equity on gross profit for deals they originate, I mean, it's, they could easily make 40K part-time, 30K part-time, or if they kill it, they can make north of $100,000. So it's not like they're underpaid, but it's very much right. performance-based, as it should be for a role like that. Um, gotcha. There was something I was going to say. Oh, yeah, just as a dude, this, I, I just want to, this is just a good, a good, um, it's a good analogy. It's a good story, I think, for everyone to keep in mind. Like, it's so rare that deals get served up on a silver platter. And anytime we ever have a problem with a LEA member, it's because they're looking for the silver platter deals and they don't realize there's money sitting in their CRM that they're neglecting because it's hard. And it's uncomfortable mm -hmm. conversations or there's things that they are confusing about the deal. There's a guy named Peter, and we shared this last week on one of our calls. Uh, he's just completing his first deal. Listen to this first deal. <laughs> okay. Uh, and he's scrubbing his data like a maniac now. But when he first started, he wasn't. And so this came from unscrubbed uh, material. So he, he sent out 10,000 mailers. And he got a lot of leads, but there's just a lot of just junk properties. And I was like, all right, I need to start scrubbing. Get some land insights, start scrubbing. But this lead came from that first campaign. So it was a property that he had to take through probate. So he had to take it through probate, clear the title, but it didn't have access. So fuck, how am I going to get access? He goes, contacts the neighbor. They've owned a big property. He says, why don't you just section off a couple acres? So he subdivides a piece of their property for access. Um, and then he's double closing his whole transaction. It's a three-way double close. So double closing with the seller of the original property, double closing with a neighbor who subdivided that like a couple of acres for him, double closing with a new buyer. I think it was about $30,000 a spread in that deal. I'm not saying every deal looks like that, but there's a lot of deals look like that. Uh, and that doesn't even speak to the sales process that he had to go through to get the seller on board. That's a fight. That's a tug of war in itself. So yeah, all that to be said, there's I could guarantee you there's at least a deal sitting in your CRM. Now, did that deal convert this month? Probably not. It might convert in three months. But that's how Victor can just like reinvest the profits and not have to be on this marketing hamster wheel where you're always outlaying capital. Now, I recommend yeah. still marketing in the interim. So shots on goal. I would take the market that you've already proven and done a deal and you know that market now. You know what things sell for. So go double dip on that. That was a while ago. So I would just keep on remarketing to that kind of like on a quarterly yeah. cadence. Uh, same thing with different acreage brackets in that market, maybe surrounding markets. So yeah, man, that, that that's it. I think you could get away with 2,000 to 4,000 mailers a month and ultimately probably make six figures in the next year if you're really nimble and you're really dialed in with scrubbing your data, market selection, and acquisitions. And that's why if you look at Leah, all of our Leah coaching calls, what do they surround on? Well, Mondays and Wednesdays, it's market reviews and deal reviews. And then bi weekly on Thursdays is acquisition work because that's the big unlock for new members, you know. And on that note, too, I know you're obviously you're busy and like life happens. And I, I totally understand. And, and, and usually what happens is people six months into Leah, the frequency that they show up for calls tapers by a lot, right? But to really continue growing, it's like use the resources at your disposal. Sometimes that means going back and rewatching material. Sometimes that means going and looking at like, let's let me look at the SOPs in Leah and cross reference to how I'm doing things. And are there disconnects there? And really in the beginning, you want to just kind of one to one copy. Uh, and then same thing in the Discord. So yeah, man, I, I think that there's there's still a lot of low hanging fruit for you. And that's exciting. I think that that, that kind of fires me up when I'm like, there's things that you could do that don't cost you any more money, just time, work, and maybe a little more education. Gotcha. Okay. So the, the second thing is, and so here's the thing is like, now that I got one deal, I kind of generated buzz in my circle of people wanting to get involved. <laughs> so this is also stemming from it too, is like people see the value and they're like, I want to be a part of it. I'd be, you know, um, I have someone that's looking to invest in a mailer and, you know, basically like I'll fund your mailers and then we work out the profits. But I'm like, I don't know yet. Like I haven't done a deal. Like, you know, yeah. it is a little tough because it's like they're investing the the money in the marketing and then I'm still doing all the work. So like, I don't know what do splits look like on something of, of that nature or what it, you know, would it even be feasible at this point in my business to do that? I mean, I think it's, it's cool yeah. if I can get other people to fund certain things, which is like, of course I'm in a tight spot. So it would definitely help move the needle forward. But let's say if you were, you know, someone approached you with that, like, you know, funding mailers, 
how would that look like or would you even do that at this stage in, in the yeah. piece? Yeah. Um, I uh, just to zoom out one se one second. What you'll find in this business is everyone you talk about it and everyone's interested. They want to learn from you, they want to partner up with you, they want to work with you. I would say no to almost 99% of it. It's it's just more noise than anything in the beginning. Now, funding is the one thing that that interests me, but it has to be on funding deals, in my opinion. All of the risk in this business is on the marketing. You never get that money back if it flops. Deals, you can pretty much always get your money out of the deal, right? So it's, it's, it's just a little bit of a different dynamic. So I would probably try to allocate that money more towards funding deals. There are set setups where people will fund mailers, but they also have to fund the deals. So it has to be both, in my opinion. Gotcha. And usually you'll split profits 50 50. So they're guaranteed for any deal you do from that mailer. They fund the mailer, they fund the deal, 50 50 splits. And there's funders out there that are doing that currently, but you can set that up with your with your own folks. And with, with your own people, you can adjust the term. So as one of the benefits mm -hmm. of sourcing your own money, you could do 60 40 or 70 30, whatever you want. Um, but what I would say is like, dude, using people's money to fund deals, especially if they don't understand land especially if you're friends with them, there's a lot of reputational risk there, especially if you're not optimal in every bucket yet. So I would really advise probably stay away from that. Use the big box funders money because they know that this is a business where deals might go sideways and they, they kind of accept that risk. Where yeah. Joe Joe Blow, who doesn't know, and if the deal flops, like he, he's not a professional funder. So like that's going to sting a lot or a mailer flops, right? Um, yeah. So I'd be wary of that. And I, again, I just think that this, this business is like a magnet where everyone wants in and it's exciting. And I made that mistake and we never, I never had people fund mailers, but you know, there's a lot of people want to learn from you, pick your brain, hang out, talk about it. it most of it's a distraction in the beginning. Um, yeah. Now and I, you get a lot of seeds there. Like, yeah. yeah. You can plant seeds there though. Those might be people that you continue to network and talk about, but you kind of keep them at arm's length and say, Give me some time, and then I would honestly just funnel that money towards funding deals. That uh, would be mm -hmm. be my, my my recommendation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because I think it's like once you start putting out content, it's like it's just bringing more awareness. And like yeah. uh, I have a lot of like friends that are you know running like real estate uh, like wholesale businesses or fix and flips, and they're like I have investors. Like you know I'd I'd love to to get involved and. Uh, you know, initially I'm just like, I, you know, I don't have a proof of concept with my flow yet, you know, let me, yeah. give me some time and then maybe we could revisit it. But, uh, in my mind, you know, my intuitive sense is like, don't take anything just yet. Like you, there's a lot that I can do myself, get the groundwork yeah. set and then, you know, revisit it and see, but it's always nice to know that, Hey, they, they will be there. They're, you know, they're open to it. They trust me. And like you said, once you lose that trust, it kind of like breaks my reputation, which yeah. that's a huge thing that like, you know, I don't want to put at risk is like, Hey, you know, no. letting them know that, you know, that's not how I roll. And it's like, I don't want to burn your money. Like I truly have your best, best interest of like yeah. making sure this is legit before we get together. I appreciate, you know, the excitement, but sometimes it gets yeah. me excited and it's like, I have to kind of like <laughs> take a step back, take a breather yeah. and just like slow down. So Dude, 100%. Yeah. I think that I think that's really wise and they're not going to go anywhere and you'll have many, 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 many other folks that want to fund deals or work with you in some capacity right now. Dude, I would just kind of insulate yourself and just work on making sure that all the buckets that are relevant, which right now is just marketing and acquisitions are humming along at max kind of optimization for what you can commit to. Understandably, right. you might not be able to follow the 14 day follow up cadence for new leads or whatever, but really trying to max that out. Um, and you're about to have a bit of a windfall. So you'll be able to afford marketing, but again, still, still run it like a super lean operation, kind of like do or die uh, and mm -hmm. just be just really targeted, man. And with land insights, like the, the scrubbing nowadays, you don't need a VA to do that. Like it, it's pretty realistic that you can still do that on your own. I'd rather see you get less marketing out, but just higher quality. So that's where I'd be spending my time, man. But I think you're in a good spot because you've already, you got a deal, you've got money coming back in. You've got the right expectations and there's a lot of low hanging fruit. So I mean, there's a lot of gains to be had without having to outlay a ton of money for marketing. Mm -hmm. I think for me too, is the pain of like being so tight on time. It's like, I'd rather just bring someone to do this, you know, but there's also like part of the biz where I, I need to build this, you know, like I can't hire someone for a role where I haven't gone through the crap and like worked out the kinks, have a solid process. I'm able to teach that, you know, appropriately. Yeah. Um, so with that, yeah, uh, a lot of my findings is just like, 
in the in the details of running the biz you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. going back to your point on content i have been just recording looms on the fly so i'm i'm sitting on actually like a lot of content that i can just export and upload that i probably should uh but yeah. habitually like from what i found is like um i'm never gonna really be in the right headspace or like that, like think like oh my god is this good content it's just recording like what i've been doing now is just like whenever i get a lead coming in i just record the, i just start the loom before i, I start the call mm -hmm. and now i have mm -hmm. that you know and i can like edit it however if there's like proprietary info that's going out i could just blur out the background and that's it you know i have my content uh yeah. so with that yeah it's definitely just just getting it out there that's kind of been my main thing and keeping you know low edits uh keep yeah. it very minimal just keep it raw and, and put it out there from what i heard too it's actually getting a lot of traction now and like with it like youtube algorithm i guess that's making like a comeback as like raw original content with like yeah minimal edits and whatnot it is so. it's what people like it i mean i feel like everything swung to one side of the pendulum hyper edited really polished and i think it's kind of swinging to the other side which works for guys like you and i you know what i mean so you're, you're <laughs> in a good spot um yeah. anything else you want to cover no, honestly, I think with those two nuggets is like it, it literally answers like everything that I need. Now it's just like attack. And and that's been my whole thing with uh, just approaching this biz is just attacking. Right. Like if I'm not attacking it, then we are not moving forward. Um, so every day that goes by, if I'm not even doing like, you know, anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, uh, it's time loss, you know. So yeah. with that, it's just like balancing, you know, my clientele, making sure the lights are on and then. Uh, moving forward, you know, in the biz. So, yeah. yeah, I would say with that, no, I greatly appreciate the, you know, the tips and, uh, you know, copying the uh, the ticket. That's that have helped me uh, yeah. immensely. So, I, I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, man. Yeah, Juan, we'll reach out uh, just to, to confirm with you, but we'll we'll get you added to the list, and we'll see you. Uh, what I think it's October 11th or something like that. Uh, you can see on the, uh, the mastermind landing page. And if anyone wants to join. Uh, landingmaster.co slash mastermind a lot of links shared here today we'll put everything in the description uh with that guys we'll call it here almost an hour and a half super insightful call hope this was helpful for you guys we'll put victor's uh youtube channel down below go give him some love give a comment on the video keep him going let's get him sharing some more content and uh we'll call it here all right guys thank you so much take care of yourself